begin our study portion for today's broadcast. And we're going to be talking today about Passover in the year 2021, which we are in, its meaning and its relevance today. And it is very meaningful, is very relevant, even more so as we get closer and closer to the final hours of this age and into the age to come. You know, the world today is in a state of ongoing trouble, ongoing turmoil. The earth cannot bear the sin much longer. The pestilence known as COVID-19 and the resulting chaos has impacted our country, our entire world in profound ways. And it just seems to be that no one really seems to really know what's going on. Racial tensions are high. Uh, our nation's debt has soared to great heights. Sin and sinful behavior at an all-time high. And sadly, I read recently that a Gallup poll that was just taken recently showed that one out of six young people are now identifying themselves with some form of homosexuality. How sad. It seems that people don't know who they are anymore. And it is high time that we look to the one who created us for the answers, who we are. If I was a potter, I wanted to create a vessel. I would take the clay. I would form it into what I wanted it to be. I would bake it. I'd paint it and begin to use it for whatever purpose I created it to be. And the same is true with us. Yahweh formed us from the dust of the earth. And the creator of us decides what we are, what we're used for, our purpose, our value. And so I'm going to be talking today about the importance of looking to Yahweh, our creator, for the answers on who we truly are. But first, we need to know who he says he is. And we're going to find that this relates very, very much to Passover. For instance, how many times do you read in Scripture, Yahweh says, I am Yahweh who brought you out of the land of Egypt. How many times we see that in the Scriptures over and over and over again? It's as if Yahweh is identifying himself as being the one who did this awesome act, the mighty one of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, a lot of times when, when people hear the story of how, oh, Yahweh brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt in the promised land, they think of this in terms of what Yahweh did for those people way back then, you know, the Jewish people way back then. Well, by the time I'm done with this study, I hope that you will not only come to understand that the Israelites are actually our forefathers in Messiah, but that you also be able to say with me, He is Yahweh, who brought me out of Egypt, gave me grace, and is bringing me into the promised land. And so in the same way He chose to identify Himself to Israel, you can also identify Him in your own life as having done the same thing for you. And there's a powerful lesson in this. But first, let me talk to you about identity. Who are you? When people come into this walk, it's, a lot of people want to know, who are you? What are you? And that's probably the most important question one could ask, really. Who are we? Who do we see ourselves to be? That will impact our actions. Now, there are many words Yahweh uses to identify us. Scripture says that we are believers, we are saints, we are his children, we are a peculiar people, that we're called the light of the world. The list goes on and on. But there's one thing he calls us that's very important for us to understand. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, and verse 11, he says, Remember, therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by what is called circumcision made in the flesh by hands 
at that time, as if that's something that you once were, at that time when you were once Gentiles. He's talking to the Ephesians here. And speaking of their Gentile identity as something that they were in their past, something that they once were at that time. At that time that they are without Messiah, they were aliens, strangers, strangers from the commonwealth of Israel. At that time, what time? The time that they were once Gentiles. They were strangers from the commonwealth of Israel, indicating that they are no longer strangers from the commonwealth of Israel, and therefore no longer strangers from the covenants of promise which were given to Israel, having no hope and without Elohim in the world. But now in Messiah Yahshua, you who once were far off have been brought near. Brought near to who? Brought near to the commonwealth of Israel by the blood of Messiah, by his blood being shed for you. And so now, if we understand this as he wrote it, when you read scriptures that refer to Israel, don't ever refer to them as being those people somehow different than you. You are Israel. You don't replace Israel. You're joined to Israel by the blood of Yahshua the Messiah. And that's how you can become a named party in this new covenant where Yahweh says, Behold, the days are coming, says Yahweh, I will make a new covenant with the Gentiles. No. With the house of Israel and the house of Judah. You can't get there from here unless you are Israel and Judah. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers. In the day I took them, who? House of Judah, house of Israel. That's us. Now, to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says Yahweh. But this is a covenant I will make with who? The house of Israel. After those days, says Yahweh, I will put my Torah. What law is Jeremiah talking about here? The only law there ever was. The law he gave to Moshe. In their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their mighty one and they will be my people. No more will every man teach his neighbor. Every man his brother saying, No, Yahweh, they shall all know. Me from the least of them to the grace of them, says Yahweh, for I will forgive their iniquity, their sin I'll remember no more. Those are the promises, that's covenant of promise. You become a named party in this covenant of promise because of the blood of Yahshua Hamashiach. And this idea that a non Jew can become a Jew, it's not a new idea. In fact, Esther eight seventeen. And it says, in every province and city, wherever the king's command and decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a holiday. Last week, a week ago, we observed Purim. It says, then many of the people of the land became Jews. How does a non-Jew become a Jew? He's not born a Jew. I venture to say it's because of the blood of Messiah Yahshua reaching back to former generations, enabling non-Jewish people to become Jewish people, even though they did not know that's the mechanism through which it was made possible. But they joined themselves to Israel. So Yahweh identifies himself as the one who brought our forefathers, our forefathers, out of the land of Egypt and into the promised land. Now there's a promise you need to know about where Yahweh not only identifies himself as the one that brings the children of Israel out of Egypt, but something even greater than that is promised to us in Jeremiah 23, verses 5 through onward. It says, Behold, the days are coming, says Yahweh, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. That's Messiah Yahshua. 
A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved. Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called Yahweh, our righteousness. Here is a savior, a king that will reign and prosper, coming from the line of David, called Yahweh Zedkenu in Hebrew. Yahweh our righteousness. That's what he'll be called in those days. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says Yahweh, that they shall no longer say, as Yahweh lives, who brought up the children of Israel out of the land, from the land of Egypt. Oh, really? What are they going to say? As Yahweh lives, who brought up and led the descendants of the house of Israel from the north country and from all the countries where I had driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. So there will be a new exodus where Yahweh brings up and leads the descendants of the house of Israel from all the countries where he driven them back into their own land. And so we need to know there is a second exodus in our future. One that we will become a part of. And so the exodus and the Passover and the meanings of each have not yet met their fulfillment. Don't say Passover has been fulfilled. There is more to come. But we need to know who we are. We are Israel. We are this chosen generation. We are a royal priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. We are a holy nation, the holy nation of Israel, his own special people. That we may proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Beautiful, beautiful words. And so once we realize who we are according to the holy scriptures, I hope that we'll no longer think of the things that happened to Israel as something that happened to that people group somewhere back then, you know. No. Our forefathers. Because we've taken on a new identity. We are a new creation. We have been crucified with Messiah. It's no longer I who live. Messiah lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of Elohim, who loved me and gave himself for me. So if Messiah Yeshua is the one that lives and I don't live anymore, then I'm taking on his identity as an Israelite man. Because I died. And that's why Galatians 3.29 says, If you are Messiah's, then you are Abraham's seed. You are a child of Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You become Abraham's seed because you become joined to the Messiah, Yeshua. Regardless of who your physical daddy might be, now you are adopted into the family of Yisrael. And that's something to rejoice about because that's who gets all the promises. And so as we begin, begin to talk about the Passover, I'm wanting you to take a moment and look at this Passover through these lenses so that you know that you know while Passover is a memorial for something that happened to our forefathers, it actually stands as a memorial for what Yahweh plans to do for us tomorrow. And actually, it stands as memorial for what Yahweh has done for us already and what he's doing for us today, right now, in the year 2021, in our lives, personally. So let's take a look at the events in the book of Exodus, chapter 1, verse 8. It says, There arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And it happened in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us. And so, go up out of the land. They didn't want to lose them. I want you to understand that just as these Egyptians 
were afraid of the children of Israel. Scripture identifies you as a child of Israel. And just as Pharaoh did not want the children of Israel to multiply, I want to let you know, you have an enemy, Satan the devil, who does not want you to multiply. He does not want you to be become large in number. He does not want us Israelites becoming large in number. And so he seeks to destroy us. Because really, Satan knows that if we fight against him, he loses. He loses. And so he doesn't want us to become great in number. And so the truth is this. You are of Elohim, little children, and have been overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Enemies already knows who the greater one is. Just as Pharaoh really knew who was greater, the enemy knows who is greater. We are. Because of who we are. We are Israel. We are grafted in, mind you. Adopted. But just as Moshe was adopted, Esther was adopted by Mordecai. Yahshua even was adopted by his earthly father, Joseph. We are adopted. The truth is, all of us are adopted. Even natural-born Jews are guilty of sin and therefore enslaved to Pharaoh, that is Satan, and need to be redeemed in order to become the remnant Israel who are truly saved. We're all grafted in, both natural branches and unnatural branches. Romans eleven twenty three says, They also, if they don't continue in unbelief, but will be grafted in. Who's they? They're talk, talking about Israel. Elohim is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are in natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? So even they have to become adopted into the family of Israel once more, that remnant seed of Israel. So please understand, the enemy knows who you are. He wants to enslave you or destroy you, one or the other. And that's what Pharaoh chose to do, either enslave or destroy. Exodus 1, 13, 1 11 says, Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramesses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were in dread. In dread of the children of Israel. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter. Made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shiphrah, and the name of the other, Puah. And he said, When you do the duties of a midwife for the mid Hebrew women, and see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. But as the midwives feared Elohim, and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but save the male children alive. So just as Pharaoh sought to enslave or destroy, the enemy wants to do the same to you. He was, In fact, he was already working to afflict you and try to enslave you when you were still a child. Especially if he knew your destiny as a true Israelite. Because even while we are yet sinners, the enemy will sometimes try to get us before we're even believers. And the battle over our souls actually begins in childhood. Yahshua himself also went through the same thing. He was sought after by Herod, who wanted to destroy him while he was yet a child. And so Pharaoh, trying to kill the children before they even get to grow up to be an adult, 
But the truth is this, every single one of us have been enslaved to our own personal Pharaoh and his taskmasters, the demons. Because we know at one time we were sold under sin. We were sold under sin. Scripture says, the law, yeah, it's spiritual, but I'm carnal and therefore sold under sin sin. If I was sold under sin because of my carnality, I need to be delivered from slavery. Just as Israel needed to be delivered from slavery. John 8, 34, Yahshua said, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. How many of us have never committed sin? We're all guilty of having committed sin. Myself, you, everybody. But, if we're willing to cry out, then Yahweh will say, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, representing the world, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. I know their sorrows. How does Yahweh know our sorrows? How could Yahshua know our sorrows? Well, it's not too hard to figure that out. Isaiah 53 says, He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Yahshua was called a man of sorrows. He knew our sorrows. He was acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by Elohim, and afflicted. And so Yahweh, we know, sent down the plagues upon Egypt. He sent down the frogs. He sent down the lice. He sent down the flies. He sent down the diseases on animals. He sent down the boils on men, the boils on the animals, the hail, the locusts, the darkness. I encourage you to read that with your children this Passover. His purpose was to demonstrate his superiority over all the idols of Egypt because they worshipped animals. They worshipped the gods that they thought controlled pestilences and diseases. They worshipped the gods they thought were responsible for the weather. And they worshipped the sun. But Yahweh showed he's above all that, worshipped. And he had their very lives in the palm of, this, of his hand. Exodus 12, verse 12, I will pass through the land of Egypt that night. I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the mighty ones of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am Yahweh. So all the idols of Egypt, Yahweh executed judgment. And so it is with us sometime in our lives. Yahweh demonstrated himself to be clearly above all we thought was important. Above all the idols that we worshipped. Idols of money. Idols of parties and drinkingness, drinkingness. Idols of sexual immorality. Idols of the entertainment industry. The idols in sports. Idols of governors and presidents and politicians. And I find it interesting here in the year 2021, this pestilence known as the coronavirus, the COVID-19, I'm thinking may have got a lot of people's attention as to who's really in control. Governments can't save you. Doctors can't save you. And then Yahweh shut down the stadiums, the sports arenas, the civic centers, the movie theaters, all their idols. No more. The people lost their jobs. The fortunes that came with it. And he even shut down the churches. And to me, he spoke loud and clear. Second Chronicles 7, 13 and 14. He said, when I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people, 
who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and heal their land. You know, COVID-19 is indeed a pestilence. It is a pestilence among the people. And if we are willing to understand that just as he sent plagues and pestilences on Egypt to show himself as the only one worthy of worship, so he's done in our modern day today with COVID-19. And if we are willing to humble ourselves, to pray, and to seek his face, and to turn from our wicked ways, he will give us a Passover experience and save us by the blood of the Lamb. Exodus 11.4 Moshe said, Thus says Yahweh, About midnight I will go into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. Right? From the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the handmaid. And all the firstborn of the animals. Then there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as was not like it before, nor shall be like it again. And so Yahweh made this distinction between Israel and Egypt, just like he did the other plagues. And he instructed the children of Israel He says, in order to be delivered from the plague of the death upon the firstborn, you need to follow specific instructions. And those instructions are found in Exodus chapter 12, where Yahweh spoke to Moshe and Aaron in the land of Egypt and said, this month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. This is the month called Aviv. And so we have a new year. Actually, coming up the first month of the year, a week and a day from today, we will have a new moon broadcast, a new year broadcast, on what the world calls Sunday night, the 14th. And we'll be looking for the sign of the new year, the new moon, which was harvestable barley in Israel. According to Scripture, it says, Observe the month of the Aviv and keep the Passover to Yahweh your mighty one. For the month of the Aviv, Yahweh, your mighty one, brought you out of Egypt by night. It's, Aviv is not the name of the month. Nisan is the name of the month. It's the month in which there is harvestable Aviv barley. And so if you look on a calendar, first, this is going to be the night of the 14th right here. Um, it's going to be the night we go looking for the new moon because Yahweh's days begin at evening. And then that first day of the year will begin. On the 15th, and then the 14th, known as March the 28th, um, that day will be Passover day. And then the 29th will be a day of rest. We don't work on this day. It's the first day of unleavened bread. We get rid of all the leavening out of our houses on this 28th. We'll be talking more about this next week. And then the final day, the fourth fourth of what's commonly called April, will be the seventh day of unleavened bread. And that will be a day of rest also. So if you got to take off work, these are the two days you're looking for. We'll be talking more about this next week, as I said. Getting back to Exodus 12, he says, This month shall be the beginning of the month. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth day of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And so the lamb was selected on the tenth day of the month, and it was examined to determine whether or not it contained any blemishes. Because it says, if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be, he says, without blemish. 
a male of the first year may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you might wonder what this has to do with you and me. A lot of people look at Passover and see it's just one of those Jewish things, you know, have no real relevance to us as believers today in the Messiah. But Passover actually is the gospel message. Yahweh literally wrote and illustrated his plan of salvation for all mankind in the history of the Israelite nation. A nation that we now identify with because of the lamb that was found to be without blemish and therefore a worthy offering to Yahweh, a sinless man, upon whom was laid the iniquity of us all. And as it turns out, if you put Yahshua's final days out in a timeline, he was put to death during that first month of the year, and it looks like he was anointed for his burial on the tenth day of the month that they were setting aside lambs in Jerusalem. It says, when Yahshua was in Bethany, the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat on the table at the table. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. But when Yahshua was aware of it, he said to them, Why do you trouble for the woman? For she has done a good work for me. For the poor, you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. As surely I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached to the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. So, on this tenth day, Yahshua was anointed for his burial. Now it says in Exodus chapter 12, verse 6, you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. So during this four-day time period, Yahshua was questioned and examined by the scribes and Pharisees. And he was found to be without blemish. And so he was kept until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of Israel shall kill it, and the Hebrew reads, between the evenings. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat. Now notice the timing of the Passover lamb being between the evenings. This would correspond to the ninth hour of the day, as I understand. This, this year, actually, that would be about 4.10 4, in the afternoon here in Avon, Missouri. And it so happens that Yahshua was killed on this 14th day, of the first month in which they were killing Passover lambs in Jerusalem. John 18, 28 says they led Yahshua from Caiaphas to Praetorium. It was early morning, but they themselves did not go into Praetorium lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? So it was on the day of Passover that they were doing this. And Yahshua died at the ninth hour of the day. It says about the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. That is the time called between the evenings. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Yahshua had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So there was darkness until the ninth hour between the evenings. So about three to four o'clock in the afternoon, Yahshua the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world, John 1, 29, was slain for you and for me. I like to take a moment on that day of Passover, set my alarm, for that day and just remember what Yahshua did for me. You know, by and large, the anniversary 
of this momentous event goes by each year, largely ignored by modern Christianity. All his birth, his resurrection are remembered, with accompanying traditions rooted in the worship of demons, actually, pagan-rooted traditions. But the anniversary of his death, largely ignored. Why? I mean, I mean, I really believe it's because it happened on Passover. That's why. Um, and the Christian forefathers did not want to have anything to do with something that looked Jewish or required anyone looking at a Jewish calendar to find the timing. And they didn't want to share a holiday with the Jewish people, and so they had no problem, of course, adapting pagan holidays and trying to turn them into something that honors Yahshua. Something Jewish? They wanted nothing to do with that. Even though Scripture itself says we are identified as Israelite people through Messiah Yahshua, we become joined to Israel. And the children of Israel are actually our forefathers now, as adopted sons and daughters who are grafted into the olive tree. But it's separation that the enemy wants. The enemy wants you to not identify yourself at all with Israel. Why? So he can fill that void with a new identity. An identity influenced by the pagan religions he inspired men to produce. And so now there's a new religion. Yahshua never meant to start a new religion called traditional Christianity, one that's completely divorced from the Hebrew roots of our faith. And new identities pop up. I'm a Baptist. I'm a Pentecostal. I'm a Methodist. I'm a this. I'm a that. Why? We're Israel. Yahweh gave us an identity. And Passover is still relevant today. Yahweh identified himself as the Elohim who brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. Well, just as Yahweh brought Israel out of the house of bondage, out of the land of Egypt, Yahweh brought you and me out of the house of bondage, that house being your mortal bodies, your flesh, that sought to enslave you. He brought you out of Egypt. That's the world with all of its trappings and the enslavement it seeks to bring you into its sin. And just as he provided unblemished lambs for the children of Israel, he provided for you and for me an unblemished lamb the Messiah Yahshua, our Passover. And he delivered you from this house of bondage, from this land of Egypt. And now you're in a wilderness time with a promised land ahead. Now Yahweh commanded that they slay the lamb at the ninth hour of the 14th day of the first month. Specific time between the evenings. Because he knew that would be the time that Yahshua the Messiah, our Passover lamb, would die for us. And so just as the children of Israel were beginning to slaughter their Passover lambs in Jerusalem, Yahshua the Messiah was slain for you and for me as our Passover lamb. And the picture and timing would be unmistakable. Yahweh is awesome. Just awesome. And so in my, in my mind, this is a time worthy of commemorating. The day that our sin was removed from us and laid upon Yahshua the Messiah so that we could be delivered from this house of bondage, from the enslavement of our own personal Egypt. And Yahshua gave us a way to memorialize that great event. In Luke twenty two seventeen, he took the cup. He gave thanks. He said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink the fruit of the vine until the king of Elohim comes. He took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance 
of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. The bread was unleavened. The fruit of the vine representing two ministries, which I preach over and over again. The bread represents the word of Yahweh, which convicts each and every one of us the sin of the sin we've committed. And the fruit of the vine represents the blood of Yahshua, which was shed for us so that we could receive the forgiveness of sin and deliverance from death. And when we partake of this memorial and we treat Yahshua as our Passover lamb, partaking of him with the bitter herbs, representing the memories of our bitter lives before we came to know Yahshua, just as the enemy sought to rule over Israel with bitter bondage, with rigor, and made their lives bitter. So we know yeah, that our former lives, apart from Yahshua, was a very, very oppressive slavery. Slavery to our own flesh. Slavery to the sin that would otherwise dwell in us. Now, personally, I don't do traditions of men associated with the Seder, you know, like the egg. Um, the Kereseth, that's a mixture of apples, nuts, wine, and cinnamon. The Carpus, like the greens, like parsley and celery. Four cups, afikomans. None of those things are found in Scripture. I just want to do what Scripture says. Adding nothing, taking away nothing. And we partake of Messiah Yahshua with sandals on our feet, belt around our waist, staff in our hand, signifying the haste with which we want to leave this world, the Egypt we live in. And when we do this, just as the children of Israel were told to place blood on the doorposts and lintels of their dwelling places, Yahshua's blood now we partake of him in our dwelling places so that this body which was formerly a house of bondage is now the home of the one who made us free and our bodies then become a part of the body of Yahshua the Messiah and since that body is a sinless body we commemorate the removal of sin with eating unleavened bread for seven days, getting the leavening out of our home for seven days, representing what I believe is a 7,000-year time period in which Yahshua will need to cleanse the world of their sins. As long as sinful mankind exists, 7,000 years, there will need to be a Savior available to cleanse their sins. And so Scripture says, Purge out the old leaven, that you may become a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Messiah, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, therefore, let us keep the feast. He tells us, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity, of truth. Malice, wickedness, no more. We have a new body. And just as the children of Israel were told to partake of the Passover lamb that they had slain, we symbolically partake of Messiah Yahshua, our Passover lamb, that was slain for us through the partaking of the Messiah's body and his blood. And then Israel, once they left Egypt, what happened? They were pursued by Pharaoh until they came to the the Red Sea, actually the Sea of Reeds is how it would read in Scripture. Also, so they crossed this sea, and they had the wall of water on each side, right? While the men who sought to bring him into bondage perished in those waters. Paul says, moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that our fathers... All our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moshe, 
in the cloud and in the sea. So it was for us when we got baptized, the old man with its body of sin that brought us into the house of bondage died. Just as those men perished in the sea of reeds as the water came over them and drowned them. You know, when a child is being born, one of the signals that a birth is imminent is that the mother's, quote, water broke. Well, when we are baptized in water, that's a sign and a symbol of our rebirth in Messiah Yahshua and that we have joined the nation of Israel. And that was first typified when the children of Israel crossed that sea of reeds, marking the time when they're finally free from that bondage of Egypt. And now they are a new nation. The nation of Israel is now born in water. And then, just as the children of Israel went through a wilderness experience where they traveled through a land not their own. And they're taught Yahweh's commandments. They're taught his word. So they would know the way that he wanted them to live. We also are now having a wilderness experience as strangers and pilgrims in the earth. Learning Yahweh's commandments as they were so that we can know how we ought to live. I want to point out something very important. The children of Israel were in bondage to Pharaoh, and Yahweh gave them grace as long as they were willing to trust in the blood of the Lamb. But after they were baptized into the sea and into the cloud, and he gave them his commandments, his Torah, The expectation was that they would be willing to return Yahweh's love for them with a decision to love him in return. For he loved them first. And so his expectation is when he loves us first that we in turn will love him. I mean, he had given them so much. His hope was all the ways in which he served them all the ways in which he blessed them, all the ways he gave them grace and gave them mercy, that they would in turn be willing to say yes. Yahweh's done so much for me. What can I do to serve him? I'm glad to do the things that he asked me to do. After all, it's for my own good. That's not what happened. Aside from two faithful men, Joshua and Caleb, not one of them were faithful. Not one of them entered the promised land. Instead, they wasted away in the wilderness for 40 years as an act of judgment upon Yisrael for their unthankfulness and for their disobedience. And so what's the parable here for us? Look, if you just come to Yahshua without a truly thankful heart, the kind of thankfulness that results in, what can I do for you now? The kind of thankfulness that results in true repentance. We'll just perish in the wilderness. We won't survive the tests that Yahweh allows us to experience. The kind of tests that reveal what kind of man, what kind of woman we truly are. Proverbs 27 verse 19 says, As water as water face reflects face, so a man's heart reveals the man. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The answer is Yahweh. I, Yahweh, search the heart. I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. He doesn't want pretenders. He wants us to be real. 
And so Yahweh told the children of Israel, You shall remember that Yahweh your mighty one led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what was in your heart. That's why we go through tests. Yahweh wants to know what's really in our heart. What kind of person are we really? Whether we will keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know. Man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of Yahweh. Every word. New Testament, Old Testament, every word. We need both ministries, the Torah and the Messiah. The teachings of Yahweh to instruct us and correct us and lead us. And the ministry of grace given through Yahshua the Messiah. And that's why scripture says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those that keep the commandments of Elohim and the faith of Yahshua. So much is said today about us being in this so-called era of grace. Dispensation of grace. Not only is that unfair, and showing partiality, it's absolute nonsense. Children of Israel did receive grace, lots of grace. Now some people died because of their disobedience, but others were given something else. It says, thus says Yahweh, the people that survived the sword found grace, they found grace in the wilderness. They were in a land and era of grace then too. Israel when I wanted to give him rest. Yahweh has appeared of old, of old to me saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. It never goes away. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. The love of Yahweh was for them too. Yahweh has always been one to grant grace. He... Noah found grace in the eyes of Yahweh. The, Yahweh is the one that always takes the initiative. He always takes the first step. He chose to love Israel while they were in bondage. Even so, Yahweh chooses to love us while we were yet sinners. Because Elohim demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, when we were yet in the house of bondage, and we were yet in the land of Egypt, Messiah died for us. What we choose to do with that love he has for us will ultimately seal our fate. Will we, like the children of Israel, spend most of our time complaining about what we don't have? Longing for the leeks and onions of Egypt? Intense craving for the th former things? Or will we, like the children of Israel, choose to fear not believing Yahweh does love us enough to take good care of us. Deuteronomy 1.28, he says, The people were like, well, where can we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts. The people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great, fortified up to heaven. Oh, we've seen the sons of Anakim there. Or will we look beyond the flesh? And no, Yahweh will fight for us. In fact, he's willing to carry us when we're weak, too weak to stand. Well, she said, I said to you, do not be terrified, nor afraid of them. Yahweh, your mighty one, who goes before you, he will fight for you, according to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes, and in the wilderness where you saw how Yahweh, your mighty one, carried you, carried you as a man carries his son, in all the way that you went until you come to this place. So even when you're too weak to stand, even when you're too weak to walk, Yahweh carries you. So there's only one set of footprints in the sand. And for those of us who choose to be carried and led and in his arms are like Joshua, like Caleb, I'll trust in Yahweh. I'll walk in his ways. 
and I'm, I'm as the expression of thanksgiving to Yahweh, I will do as Yahweh has said. And all you have to do is get back up. If you, if you fall, you get back up. You reach for his hand. Let him pull you up. Whatever it takes, move forward. It's one thing, however, we need to take into consideration. A life lesson. An important principle that we have to make sure we understand and that we heed. You know, Moshe was a great man. He was a humble man. He accomplished great things for Yahweh. But he was not allowed to enter the promised land. It would almost seem unfair for the one who is constantly begging for Yahweh to give grace and forgiveness to Israel for all the mistakes they've made. Would himself not be granted grace when he made a mistake? But there's a lesson here that Yahweh left for us. Uh, first of all, to whom much is given, much is required. And Moshe was given a lot. So we need to make sure we, who have been given much, also out of a heart of thanksgiving for what we have been given, do the things he requires us to do with that knowledge. Yahweh help us. But the second lesson is this. Moshe represented the giving of the Torah. Whereas Yahshua represented grace and truth. John 1, 17, for the law was given through Moshe, but grace and truth came through Yahshua, Messiah. Now the law is truth. There's not something different like, well, there's a law over here, and then there's truth over here. It's the same thing. In fact, Yahshua said, sanctify them by your truth, your word is truth. Okay? So when, when it's saying the Torah was given through Moshe, truth was given through Moshe. It was. But the law itself simply represents the standard that Yahweh expects us to live by. The law cannot, in and of itself, save us. In fact, it only condemns us. And so, therefore, we need grace and truth. Yahshua is the one through whom grace comes. But you know, he was also the one giving that Torah in the wilderness. Through Moshe. He spoke it to Moshe. Moshe gave it to the people. And he was a giver of Torah when he came to the earth, saying, we should keep his commandments. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. But here's the reason why I believe Yahweh would not allow Moshe to bring the children of Israel into the promised land, but instead chose Joshua to lead them into the land. Because Moshe only represented the Torah. But Moshe, while he, he pleaded for Yahweh's grace, could not himself give us grace. We need a man named Yahshua, to do that. And so it was for them. Moshe could not lead them in the promised land. The Torah by itself cannot take you to the promised land. For them it took a man named Joshua, which in Hebrew actually is pronounced Yahshua. Same name as our Savior. It took a man named Yahshua to bring them there. So in all of our law-keeping, understand this. Moshe can show you how to live. But you need Yahshua to take you to the promised land. Your own righteousness is not going to be enough. Just as Moshe's righteousness was not enough. He was almost perfect. But one moment of imperfection was all it took. One transgression. He's a guilty sinner in need of Yahshua to take him across the Jordan. And one day, he will. We all need to remember the place from which we came. 
in all of our journeying that we do here on the, in the wilderness. It's not our own righteousness that will bring us in the promised land. From our vantage point today, we always look back and say, you know what? There was one day when darkness was over the land, and there was a man named Yahshua who hung there on a tree, fighting to breathe. Suffering and bearing the way of the world. Our weight. The weight of all the sins that we've committed. Pardon me. With the blood dripping down from the crown of thorns they place on his head. A crown we earned. But it's placed on him. As upon him was laid the iniquity of us all. That day of Passover. Where the lamb was slain for you and for me. He is the one that saves us. He is the one that gave us the righteousness we need to stand before a holy Elohim. He is the one that gave us grace when we were yet sinners. And he is the one that today gives us grace in the wilderness. All the more reason to do just what he said. He said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As a memorial to never become high-minded or arrogant, thinking we saved ourselves. It's his love that saved us. His love for us that saved us. And that's why Paul went on and on in his letters about how grace is a gift of Elohim, not of yourselves. None of us can boast about anything. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of Elohim, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Messiah Yahshua for good works. Remember, your created purpose, brothers and sisters. You were created in Messiah Yahshua for good works. He's the one that creates those good works in you. If there is anything good in you or in me, it's because Yahshua created those things. We were created in Messiah Yahshua for good works. Even the righteousness we exhibit, it's his work in us because we allow him to work his strength in us. We are his workmanship. We yield to the potter's hands. Don't ever forget, you are saved by grace through faith. It is Yahweh who gives you the strength to do the things that you do. And that's why we need Passover. This memorial of Yahshua's death. We need more than just some day to celebrate his resurrection. We need to memorialize his death and memorialize his death during Passover, the day he actually died. And so we need to refrain from this leavening too, you know, from the seven days. He says, don't eat any leavening. Take it out of your house. As a memorial for what Yahshua did for taking that sin out of our house. Delivering us from this sinful house of bondage. So we remember what Yahshua did in removing the sin from our house and delivering us from this house of bondage. Exodus twelve fifteen he says, Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove the leaven from your houses. Whoever eats leavened bread from the first day to the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day... There shall be a holy convocation. And on the seventh day, there shall be a holy convocation for you. No manner of work shall be done in them, but that which everyone must eat, that only may be prepared by you. 
the details will go into that next week. But listen, there are two days we need to not work. Make it a holiday. Take time off work. Remember what Yahweh did for you. You know, people have Memorial Day here in the United States. People take off work on Memorial Day. Why? To remember the ones who gave their lives for the country. Well, how much more so ought we to memorialize the one who gave his life for the whole world? I mean, after all, Yahweh actually identifies himself by this act, by this awesome act, saying, I am Yahweh, your mighty one, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. He brought you, ma'am, you, sir, out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, and since he loved you, love him back. Put no mighty ones before him. Don't make an idol out of him. Remember his name. Remember his day. And that's how he begins the Ten Commandments. I've done for you. If you are thankful for what I've done for you, I have loved you. Love me because I loved you first. Remember, I'm the one that saved you. And so rather than taking some fake holiday like Easter, which sadly is named after a pagan goddess, mind you, Astarte, go back and observe the true holy days that are actually found in Scripture with powerful, impactful, deeply profound meanings that encourage us instruct us and cause us to want to rise up with a shout of thanksgiving for what Yahweh has done for us in Messiah Yahshua, bringing us out of the world and out of the house of bondage. For he who has died has been made free from sin. We died. The old man perished in the waters. If we died in Messiah, we believe that we also shall live with him, knowing the Messiah, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him, and therefore death has no dominion over us. Yes, he resurrected, not on Easter Sunday, but on the day of first fruits. The day when they were waving that first fruits of the food that come out of the ground every year, that barley, they're waving that barley. Can't throw it in the air and, and touch the sky with it, so they're waving it back and forth as a first fruits offering to Yahweh. That's what Yahshua fulfilled in his resurrection. It has nothing to do with bunnies or eggs or Easter's or none of that. It's scripture. Let's get back to Scripture. And so out of the knowledge, this old man who sought to enslave us thankfully perished in the baptismal waters. We're going to accept this glorious truth. There's a new man who's now walking in the newness of life with a truly glorious, glorious destiny. And though there are fiery trials to try us, enemies on all sides that will seek to harm us and discredit us and cast our names as evil, we have a glorious destiny, one they can never touch. We start our study today discussing the importance of of letting Yahweh define who we are, recognizing he's a potter, we're the clay. He made us, therefore he decides who we are, what our creative purpose truly is. We need to continually connect ourselves to that reality. Well, Yahshua, you know, on two occasions, just before Passover actually, he went to the temple and he drove out those who made merchandise of Yahweh's word. Well, we are a new creation. Therefore, this temple, it's time we throw out the old leavening. Cast it away. You gotta take a whip of cords and drive it away. Whatever you gotta do, get rid of it. The old leavening of pride, the old leavening of false teachings. The old leavening of hypocrisy and wickedness and malice. And examine yourself. 
And as you do so, look for any leavening you're allowing in this temple, in your bodies, in your hearts, in your minds, and drive it out. And let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. 1 Corinthians 11.28 For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the master's body. For this reason many are weak and sick among you and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. It's time to judge yourself. Judge yourself. Reason. And when you find the leavening, when you find the sin, hand it over to Yahshua. And behold, the Lamb of Elohim, who takes away the sin of the world. That Passover lamb of Elohim, knowing he, Yahshua, that Passover lamb, taking away the sins of the world, will also take away your sin. So give him full access. All right, Yahshua, whatever there is, show it to me. I want to get rid of it. And then we'll be part of that second exodus that meeting of Yahshua in the air. As Yahshua, the son of Nun, part of the Jordan River, remember, they were carrying the ark, the priests put their feet in the Jordan River, the river stopped. The very river Yahshua was baptized in. And then the children of Israel crossed that Jordan River, and so the miracle of of Water, being a wall, happened twice. But many from that generation that was born in the desert, in the wilderness, never experienced that Sea of Reed crossing. They weren't there. They weren't even born yet. And so Yahweh had the children of Israel cross this Jordan River. So they had that experience. But this time led by a man named Yahshua. Because that's not enough, brothers and sisters, for us to be baptized into Moshe. We need Yahshua to lead us through the baptismal waters of the rivers of Jordan. And it may very well be the reason why Yahshua told John the Baptist to baptize him, fulfilling all righteousness so that we, being a part of now the body of the Messiah, might be among those actually baptized in that river Jordan because we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Therefore, fulfilling the Torah illustration of the complete plan of salvation written in the history of the nation of Israel. They didn't know why they were doing what they were doing. We do. And it's amazing. So when Yahshua returns, we'll meet him in the air. And be a part of that great exodus when we will have left this present world finally with all of its troubles and stresses and, and we will reign with Yahshua forever. And then we'll have that true rebirth as we go through that final water, that true rebirth. When the corruption puts on incorruption in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, 1 Corinthians 15, 52. The trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass that saying that was written, Death is swallowed up in victory. And then we will look and we'll behold the one who delivered us from this carnal house of bondage, the one who freed us from captivity and released us from being bound to the prison of self-centeredness. And look at our brand new heart, fully healed. We will ever be praising him. Until then, don't forget the day he told us to remember. 
doing what he said to do in remembrance of him. Let's not set aside the memorial of our Savior's death on the day that he spared Israel from death. Back in the book of Exodus, that also being the day he delivered us with Yahshua, our Passover, being sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Let's give honor to the King of Kings, because he is worthy. He is worthy. Let's pray. O oh, Yahweh, our great mighty one, lover of our souls, Redeemer of our houses of bondage. Deliverer from our Egypts. We praise you. Your word is awesome. Your word is amazing. Your works cause us almost to just be completely speechless. And the more we open your word, Father Yahweh, like layers of an onion, the more we discover the height, width, depth, and your love being the common thread woven through it all. And we give you praise and honor for this awesome and blessed memorial. And we want to remember, Yahweh, your awesome works. We don't want to forget how much more we don't want to turn to something you have done into some pagan celebration. Convict those, Father, who are doing that. Reveal to them your amazing word, the depths of your word, the amazing message of salvation found in these feast days. And this is just the first one. Help us, Father, to communicate this good word to the whole world, that they might partake of this blessing and know your great love and have that yearly reminder. I've often wondered, Abba Yahweh, what might have happened if those who believed in your son might have kept Passover? How many of the people who were Jews in the flesh might have been saved? Because truly, Yahshua is woven and written all over it. Reach out to them, Abba Yahweh, with this truth. And reach out toward those who do not know you at all, who are in the house of bondage, who are in slavery. Help us to be the carriers of this great news. Yahshua in us, and we are set free. Because we know and we are sure that you, O oh Yahweh, yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power and the glory. Show us any leaven in our hearts. Seek out the depths of our hearts and reveal to us anything that offends, any malice, any wickedness, any hypocrisy, any false doctrine, anything that's not from your throne. For truly we know and we are sure all praise and honor and worship belongs to you. Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh our mighty one, forever and ever. In Yahshua's great name we pray. Amen.